Hi, my name is Shane Burkhall, and I worked with Dr. Dunn this summer on a project that we're calling The Social Psychology of Disability. I made a video for my presentation just because I can't talk for long periods of time without my jaw muscles being affected, and so I figured I'd do it this way, and then we can have questions afterwards. The project that Dr. Dunn and I are working on this summer is twofold for me. First, Dr. Dunn is writing a book for the Oxford University Press called The Social Psychology of Disability. And he asked me to come on board and help him with that book. And although I'm not writing it, I'm editing, critiquing, offering new insight that I have as a person with a disability. If I had to quickly summarize the book, I would say that it's about the perception cognition, emotion, judgment, and behavior of people with disabilities. But in addition to helping Dr. Dunn with the book, I'm also doing my own article, uh, which I haven't titled yet, but it's basically a response to some of the criticism that I've been getting about my blog, um, which is about my life and my disability, and it fits in really nicely with uh, the book that Dr. Dunn's writing since they're kind of both about the social aspect of having a disability. And so, not only is this project personal for me, but it's also about academic because I'm learning a lot in the process. And it has a business aspect too, because from my blog, I started a nonprofit called Laughing at My Nightmare Inc. And our mission is to show people that there's always a reason to be happy while also raising money for my student dystrophy research. I think it's really important for me as president of the company to address our critics so that people understand that we are taking the time to think these things through and that we're not just acting impulsively without giving any thought to the implications that our work has. So first I'm going to focus on the book that I've been working on with Dr. Dunn, just because so far that's been a majority of my workload and it's what I've accomplished the most on. Whenever I start anything, I like to ask myself, why does it matter? Why am I doing this? And for this project, there's a few reasons. But I think the best way for me to show you guys really what we're dealing with is to tell a quick story about something that's happened in my life that really relates to the idea of the social psychology of disability. So this happened a few years ago, and I went into a restaurant with a couple of my friends, and I got the usual very slow speaking waiter who said, Hello, sir, what would you like to order today? You know, very um, patronizing. Um, which is how I've been treated by strangers my entire life. But while we were eating, a man that was sitting a few tables away came over and sat down with my friends and I. It was very strange. And he started talking to us and asking us if we liked sports and if we liked hockey. We didn't, really. But we told him that we did just to be nice. And out of nowhere, he offered us box seats to a Philadelphia Flyers game for free. Um, and upon inquiring a little bit more about why he would do this and why he had offered them to us, he told us that it was really inspiring to see me out in the public with my friends, um, which is something that I had to try really hard to not laugh at when he said to us. But um, that mindset that people with disabilities are suffering and that it's so great when they're out in the public and that they have friends um, and then wanting to be very charitable towards them and give them free things and treat them nicely no matter what really illustrates the basis for most of the content in the book that Dr. Dunn's writing. The ultimate purpose in understanding the social psychology of disability is to improve interactions between people with disabilities 
and people that don't have disabilities. It's to ask the question, what should happen in social situations where people with disabilities are concerned to ultimately improve the lives of people with disabilities, their caregivers, and their families. There's a lot of material to cover regarding the social psychology of disability, so I picked out some of the most important and most interesting concepts from the book that I wanted to talk about so that we're not here for hours as I go through every single detail. The first concept is Lewin's person-environment relation. Lewin argued that influences found in social situations often override the impact of personal factors like personalities or dispositions. So in other words, how you perceive your environment affects both your subjective experience, but also how you behave. For example, even a loud, extroverted, obnoxious person is most likely going to conform to the social values of being in church, and he will sit quietly and not be loud and obnoxious because the social setting that he's in tells him to behave in accordance with the rules associated with the church. A common formula in psychology is behavior equals the function of the person and the perceived environment. So it's an interplay between both the personalities and the environment. Even though this is the case that the environment plays a very large role on behavior, Lewin realized that observers generally ignore the situation or environmental factors on behavior for people with disabilities. Instead, they attribute that behavior to qualities of the person, especially like personality characteristics. For example, if an observer sees a person who is blind being led through a building by another individual, they would probably be more they would probably be more likely to assume that that blind individual is lazy rather than considering the possibility that the building doesn't have braille signs which would make it possible for that individual to navigate the building on their own. The insider outsider distinction is another common concept in the social psychology of disability. It distinguishes between people who have a disability, which are the insiders, and those non-disabled observers or outsiders who have to use mental effort to imagine what having a disability must be like. This distinction is important because outsiders usually assume to know what a physical or psychological disability must be like. They assume it's awful and terrible and depressing and really disruptive to the daily living of the insiders. They assume that the disability is an ongoing annoyance for the insiders, so much so that living a normal or happy life is not possible. Obviously, or maybe not obviously, the presence of a disability or absence of one does not predict quality of life which is comprised of many different facets of a person's life. Going back to the story I told about a man who gave my friends and I tickets to a Flyers game, that man most likely assumed that my life was just awful and that it really was a great, big, inspirational thing that I had left my house, when that's obviously not the case. Rehabilitation psychologists have been concerned with the study of attitudes towards people with disabilities for a long time, and it's pretty clear why they're concerned with it. In order to advance the lives and opportunities for people with disabilities in terms of education, civil rights, employment, society needs to be welcoming or at least neutral 
to people with disabilities. And so an understanding of non-disabled people's attitudes will suggest ways that rehabilitation psychologists can create interventions that will promote more positive interactions between the two groups of people. For the most part, studies have shown that attitudes towards people with disabilities are negative. Now there's a variety of reasons for this. I've selected a few of them to go over. First is the moral beliefs about disability. Now this is an older reason for negative attitudes, but in some cultures still today, disability is associated with punishment for sin and wrongdoing, either that of the person who has a disability or his or her family. In some cultures, this phenomenon leads to the rejection and fear of people with disabilities. Then there's anxiety due to unstructured social encounters. This is similar to the things that I face every time I go out in public when people don't really know how to treat me. Lack of experience with people with disabilities can lead to anxiety and negative feelings and even awkward reactions to disability. Next is shared responses to minority groups. People with disabilities are often marginalized, like members of other minority groups, such as race and ethnicity, religion, and sexuality. So they evoke stereotypes, prejudice, and discriminatory behavior from people of the majority group. There's social and cultural conditioning. Basically, we all know that society tells us that we have to be physically attractive and beautiful, and if we are, that's good. If we're not, that's bad. Um, this leads to an overemphasis on having a healthy body and a fit figure, and so reactions to disability are almost automatic because a disabled person doesn't fit that societal picture of what a beautiful person should be. And the last one is fear of death thoughts. The loss of mobility and function can stir up a lot of symbolic associations with death. Non-disabled people can be negatively affected by disability because it reminds them of their own mortality. These are just some of the many reasons that attitudes to towards people with disabilities are by and large negative. Okay, so we understand that attitudes towards people with disabilities are negative, if not at least ambivalent. But that's only half the problem, is understanding it. How do you go about changing those attitudes and improving relationships between disabled people and non-disabled people? Well, just like all the reasons that those negative attitudes exist, there's also a variety of ways to change those attitudes. And I'm not going to go through all of them, but the method that I've found that works the best is the contact hypothesis. Today, over 500 empirical studies attest to the benefits of promoting meaningful contact between diverse groups of people. The idea is that if you put people who are different from one another together, it will lead to more harmonious feelings, beliefs, and behaviors between those two groups of people. Throughout my life, I've found that, yeah, when I'm out in public and meeting strangers, they often treat me negatively or at least, or at least awkwardly in the beginning. But the more interaction I have with them, the more they begin to understand that just because I'm physically disabled doesn't mean that I'm mentally disabled or emotionally disabled. It doesn't mean they have to treat me differently. It doesn't mean they have to patronize me. Another study that I found really interesting was that if you have children imagine contact between themselves and a disabled person, and you encourage them to 
imagine the interaction in a positive way, it actually reduces bias between non-disabled children and disabled children. So just having non-disabled kids think about treating disabled kids normally actually leads to that type of behavior. Alright, so now I'm going to talk about the article that I'll be writing just a little bit. First, some background information. For about two years, I've been writing a blog about what it's like to live with spinal muscular atrophy. I try to be as honest as possible, so I often talk about my fears about death. I try to be honest about when I notice myself uh, getting physically worse. Um, but whenever I talk about any of this stuff, I do it in a humorous way and I laugh at it because throughout my life I've found that the best way for me to cope with the stuff I have to deal with is to laugh at it and make fun of it. My message of laughing at your nightmare really seemed to resonate with many people. Today I have over 400,000 followers and I've heard from thousands of them that reading my story and seeing how I laugh at my disability has encouraged them or reminded them to not take life so seriously, not take their own problems too seriously, and to laugh at their own problems the same way that I try to. Well, that's all good, but recently I've been getting some negative criticism from mostly disabled people, and it's really the first time in my life that i faced anything like this because for the past two years it's really been smooth sailing and I only heard great things from people who read my blog, but now I'm seeing more and more comments by disabled people who are telling me that I am what they call inspiration porn. Inspiration porn is a term that refers to things that trivialize disability or poke or tug at the heartstrings to try to get pity out of people um, because of a disability. This is a good example of inspiration porn. As you can see, the kid in this picture is simply walking or running on his prosthetic legs, but able-bodied people see this and find incredible inspiration because of the fact that this kid's able to live his life without being largely depressed all the time. So in addition to examining what makes something inspiration porn and what the implications of inspiration porn are, I'm also going to be looking into the differences in mindsets between disabled people who were born or acquired their different disabilities pre or post ADA. Many of, much of the criticism that I've received has been focused upon the fact that I don't understand what life was like before the ADA and because of that disabled people say that I don't appreciate all the struggles that most disabled people who were born before the ADA went through and for some reason that makes everything I'm doing invalid. So I figured I should examine that and see what the difference is in mindsets might be. I'm hoping that when I finish writing the article, I can get it published in some type of either rehabilitation or disability psychology journal. Um, I'm really looking forward to working on it throughout the rest of the summer, and I hope that you guys have enjoyed my project and learned a little bit, and if you have any questions, I would love to at least try to answer them. Thank you.